I've just started my postdoc here at uh, LSU in uh, biomed. And uh, so I'm going to be going over uh, some uh, uh, bioinformatics techniques and uh, just kind of an overview of uh, 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 bioinformatics pipelines and uh, where and a few possibilities I see for uh, bioinformatics here at uh, what um, at, uh, LBR, at LBRN and uh, uh, Biomed. Now, bioinformatics is a rapidly changing field that is integrally related to both with biology and technology. Um, it now requires a unique capability to constantly kind of readjust, and this is this more than thinking outside the box, but you have to be able to kind of rebuild the box sometimes uh, for each project that comes in. Uh, this was uh, this was from a recent, recent Nature article. Um, it, was, it was taken the, at, and it was, it was at the University of Texas Health Science Center, and they tracked 46 data projects. And over these 46 data projects, they tracked, they use uh, a unique uh, pipeline, they use the same pipeline. As you see, uh, it's not like they did the same thing every time, but uh, a good portion of the time, they just, they had to completely throw it out and start over again as far as the workflow that they used. Um, this just reinforces a lot of the challenges that is facing, that are facing uh, the bio, bioinformaticians and the bioinformatics field uh, today. Now, in addition to the rapidly changing technology, bioinformatics is, uh, is uh, was expanded as well as the data capacity and just the, the, the sheer volume of, of data uh, that has, has grown. As, as has been as discussed by numerous speakers, um, the, the, the data volumes have, have just rapidly uh, increased over the years. Uh, this, again, this is from uh, Life Science and Applications. This is, this is back in 2014. This may not even, oops, this may not even be accurate. Uh, and it's projected in 2020 that it would be 10 to the fourth exabytes. Um, I, I think this is an undershooting as far as, this is for global information. I think that that actually is too low that we're going to overshoot that as far as what data, how much data we're going to be using. Um, now, the, the reason, I, the reason I chose this is that it, it's interesting that um, a lot of the, th this is global data. Now, bioinformatics tools and a lot of these same tools uh, can be used with d uh, data sets that have multiple large data points, um, like uh, uh, like med the, in the medical field. Now, this a lot of that land is uh, bioinformatics. But in addition, um, uh, another, another data point that can be used is like social media with Twitter. If you just picture you know, a lot of a lot of uh, any large data set that has multiple feeds. These same tools uh, can be used again and again. Um, I wrote the presentation before I heard Dr. Mason's uh, <laughs> presentation. I don't mean to offend anybody, but um, I just wanted to wanted you here is kind of just quick, quick re recap or quick recap and overview. This big data. It's a, uh, it's a it's kind of a broad it's a broad term that has been used a lot and thrown around a lot. But it's kind of just well it's it's a it's a use, term to use if you have a lot of data points. And the, and the normal approach that has been used, can't, you can't use it anymore. And this is something that actually I'll bring up um, as kind of the, what, I, what, I took, what I took a look at when I was first uh, starting to decide how am I going to set things up. Um, and, and again, I brought up uh, Hadoop and Google. Uh, Google uses a, a, a similar uh, a, a kind of a big data approach as far as that they have many, many data points. Uh, they are information overlords. They have all of our information. Hadoop is used, uh, uh, was used by uh, Yahoo, but it, basically that's that's what's been uh, this what possibility for one of the big data approaches. Um, it had kind of been a nutshell what it's was done is that if you, instead of having one computer, uh, that uh, you have several different nodes that are, are basically your tasks are seeded to the nodes, and then from there uh, 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 master collector a uh, master point then collects all the tasks back. Now. Like I said, when I first started, I, um, I had to figure out how I'm going to start working and how, how, how I'm going to complete um, bioinformatics tasks. There are several tools that I could use. Um, one of these is uh, obviously Galaxy. Galaxy is a very powerful and very, very good tool to use. Um, uh, LSU here has a, a, a tool, Partech. Um, but it, I, there's obviously there's a lot of open source tools. And instead of uh, deciding to pick one, I decided to go with all of them. 
Um, and so what I did was I set up a uh, Ubuntu Linux and I called it Bioblending. And I basically started building pipelines, uh, top line, top out pipelines, very color. And when I was faced with our uh, bioinformatics tasks, what I did is basically this became the kind of test area that would work out of pipelines. And then these the, the same pipelines that I worked out would get seeded to either Galaxy or Partech. But what the really cool thing is that Galaxy and Partech use the same tools. So there's kind of there's back and forth synergy going on. So basically, if I found if I wasn't sure about the best um, the, the best workflow to go through to uh, process I import, turns out lo and behold, Partech has their own pipeline, which I'll show in a later slide that they published. Uh, it turns out actually Partech, that pipeline is, is from a white paper that uh, I import published. But again, it's just, there's there's a lot of different ways that you can use to set this up. Um, and Hadoop, uh, that's something I'm planning very, very soon to start, try to roll out either with Lani or with, uh, uh, with an uh, Amazon EC2 instance. Now, the, for, the, 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 the example I'm going to use is, a, uh, is an example of HSV. Um, quick, quick, very quick, quick recap on immunology. Um, uh, toll like receptor, oh, mighty dependent signaling usually, if I say canonical, uh, is because it's, it's usually dependent on either toll like receptor 3 or toll like receptor 7. Um, toll like receptor, th uh, 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 excuse me, Toll like receptor 3 uh, uh, dependent signaling can trigger anaphora beta. Mighty 88 is usually dependent on toll like receptor 7. Um, after so single strand RNA uh, binds, then it triggers mighty 88. And this uh, can trigger several responses, um, uh, such as I, uh, interferon alpha or an interferon beta. Now, the what interestingly, a recent paper by Kayadal showed. Uh, that in addition to toll like receptor 7, uh, toll like receptor 2 may trigger a pro-inflammatory response from HSV glycoprotein B. Um, so this was something that uh, that we wanted to that, that's uh, we wanted to investigate. So in a previous paper it has been shown that involute glycoprotein K is required for ocular immunogenesis and neural cell injury. So um, the, so, so, so the, the hypothesis that, the, that we're looking at was to, we want to investigate the role of glycoprotein K on infection and pathogenesis. Um, human coronal epithelial cells were affected with either HSV1 uh, and this, and, or mutant HSV, uh, the McRae cell virus. Now, this is, this is step one, and the transcriptomes, the, the, both are infected, uh, with, uh, the infected cells were then sequenced with ion torrent. And at this, at this moment in time, the, the sequencer is running, and we're trying we're going to look at look for uh, differential expression between the mutants and the wild type virus. Now, go back to, if we go back to a, a few more slides, I mentioned that I have my kind of test area and the uh, part tech. When I took a look at the one, uh, oh sorry, I should have put it uh, bigger. Um, this is a uh, gene scan between mutant and the wild type. When I, when I ran through my, my pipeline on, uh, uh, on Biobunty, um, it showed a pretty good gene scan. This is basically what I did, what, and again, apologize about, about the lack of title. It looked at wild type versus mutant for a uh, gene, uh, gene scatter between, uh, when, after running through, for, the first step was uh, top hat, then after top hat, top hat went to cufflinks, or cufflinks went to cup diff. Um, as you see, basically, you want to you want to see a, a, scatter, a pretty good linear, linear scatter, and, and I saw that. However, after this point, uh, cuffed it through an error, and then got unhappy. Um, so what it did from there is went back to Partech, and uh, and uh, Partech is currently still running. But Partech, uh, if you do a quick walkthrough, um, Partech, what it does, and what we really like about it, is that it allows you to pretty much set up an entire run. And you don't have to worry about it throwing errors. It'll actually solve the errors for you. It may take some time, but as you can see, you start with online reads. It'll actually trim the reads for you. And then, uh, and then after trimming the reads, it will uh, align the reads. It'll do the post-alignment step, and then go through and do gene expression. And then, uh, and then uh, from gene expression, you can do uh, uh, you, um, you can set up either gene ontology, or you can set up a heat map. Uh, you can set up a heat map from here. Um, this right here, that is that uh, pipeline that I mentioned that actually went to here and checked. And this, uh, this from here, what they, where they got this, 
was this was a white paper that was published by Iron Torch. In a nutshell, basically you trim your you trim your reads. Then from there you run a top hat right here. Top hat then uh, looks for splice and that first uh, uh, what, um, looks for splice reads. And then from there it takes the unaligned reads and runs bow tie and it looks for very sensitive uh, local alignment. And it merges all the alignments. And then from there, you know, from here, you can actually choose, but generally the default is just going to go with uh, cufflinks. And then from cufflinks, um, it, you can uh, do uh, downstream gene analysis. So, so the the from so in addition from after running Partec, uh, the from here from here that the next step, like I said, is to Go ahead and uh, to, is take a look at what um, what the gene expression, and from there, after we determine the gene expression between Waltech and mutant, then uh, I'll pass it along to other other members of, of the group, and they'll uh, they'll continue to look specifically for genes that are expressed, and uh, and keep going in this experiment, and we'll hopefully get uh, publications. The last area that I want to look at is something. Um, it it's kind of takes it, it's it takes a look at the, the, what's normally been done and kind of does 180. Um, one of the key tasks in bioinformatics is not just taking a look at data and uh, and being able to uh, uh, analyze it, but taking a look at data, analyzing it, and then making it be able to uh, make, kind of make a human readable, uh, human readable result. So one uh, one area that I want to do, what I'm looking at, is going to getting smaller instead of getting bigger, um, creating apps to visualize and analyze data. Um, and this isn't just kind of uh, uh, fluffy apps. Basically, what I'm doing is Take, uh, using apps on iOS, so basically be the Swift programming language, um, and using these apps to uh, essentially, after completing the workflow, um, use it both to visualize uh, and, and to, uh, visualize the actual data. So uh, even uh, even going so far as looking at um, uh, uh, alignments, um, it's something kind of like a, a lightweight version of IGB. Um, test runs that I've done with uh, with, al with, uh, with alignments have shown that I, you, it is possible theoretically. To do uh, a BWA alignment using an using a, a using a, basically the architecture of the phone up to one KB, it crashes after that. But now this is important because if you have that much memory, that much uh, that much uh, processing power, then you can start looking at doing other uh, uh, implementations of it. Um, in addition, it um, it, makes, it starts it just reinforces that you want to be able to uh, t take take data. And enable uh, enable scientists to keep uh, keep working on the data, and not not have any uh, confusion with uh, what the data means. Um, Multi-tool app has been out for a while. Um, uh, BioFinds another app I'm looking at to, uh, to basically take uh, results from uh, from workflows and be able to uh, that, that easily pull uh, uh, pull data points from da databases like uh, PubMed uh, or uh, Embry. So. Just to kind of wrap things up, um, I'm going to keep developing uh, uh, keep developing the big air approach with Hadoop. I'm going to expand that to either Lani or uh, Amazon EZ2. Um, I'm going to definitely roll out uh, BioBuntu, and uh, for any collaborators who would like to use it, uh, that they, they'll only be on the LSU campus. Uh, uh, but uh, and, and collaborators would like to use it. And in addition, with BioBuntu, this is something I forgot to mention. Um, the pipelines that I've been writing are, will be available to to be used on BioBuntu. So you don't have to worry about uh, essentially typing the entire pipeline from scratch, basically creating a repository on BioBuntu to run your analyses. Um, and then uh, lastly, expand mobile platforms so that uh, if you, once you have your data, it's easy to pull up, easy to use, and uh, easy to keep going with your research. And uh, that's, uh, that about wraps things up. Uh, does anyone have any questions? <laughs> Quick question. BioBuntu is your distribution, right? Uh, no, BioBuntu is just a nickname of it. Basically, it's the, the server that's set up with all the Bioinformatics tools. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, that's, It's basically just the nickname we gave to the server. The distributions were the Swift uh, iOS apps that they were. Oh, okay. Okay, I got you. Well, I guess in that case, I was going to mention that the Swift apps, mm -hmm. uh, you might, have you might have considered possibly, uh, uh, I'm not sure if like, you're reading the entire you know, uh, sequence. <coughs> And whenever you're, um, you're working on the phone, you consider possibly um, chunking your data if you don't already. That, thank you. That's a great question. Um, I, uh, I should, should have talked about that. Um, 
uh, you run into two, I run into two problems when uh, looking at looking on a mobile platform. One is space. Um, even I mean, in theory, you mobile tech two ton three. One is that um, you don't you don't you're not necessarily going to know when someone has phone is going to be eight gig sixteen thirty two. And even if it's an eight gig, realistically, your average person is only going to have maybe two gigs, which is well, yeah, you're like <laughs> that's that's gone in a heartbeat. John, have you heard of BioLinux? Heard the name, but don't know much about it. It's a, a Mint-based Linux distribution where they've done something similar and they've packaged a lot of bioinformatics tools. Yes, in. yes. Yeah. Oh, cool. Is that um, is that somehow different from what you're working on, and, and how how did that not work for you? Um, basically, I I be completely honest. I just didn't really know it was there, and I I, I, I kind of subsequently stumbled on it, but then. Okay, I did lose there when I started, and also I kind of like starting from scratch because I have to start from scratch, kind of build it. And if something goes, if you if I start from scratch and build it, then I know what went wrong. But if I pick up a prepackaged something, uh, that that's actually one of the ways I prefer to start from scratch versus simply just running and grabbing hard time. That's one of the problems we had because we tried out BioLinux, but yeah. part of the problem with it is all the tools that they put in it are static yeah. unless you get a new yeah. distribution. So we went the same route and we installed Ubuntu. <laughs> Put our own tools on it and use Quanzilla to just put it yep. on different machines. But I, I wonder if you have any kind of vision as to how to potentially solve that problem. If you're continually distributing this bio Ubuntu, mm -hmm. are you going to have do you envision a way of automatically updating the tools in it, or do you have to create a new image every time you want to update tools? Well, one of the routes I went actually was um, when kind of the 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 the, the pre pre version, the very first version of the of the of by a bunch of that I wrote was um, it, I, I kind of when I got to a certain point, I was like, okay, this is a good, this looks good. How do I back this up? And it occurred to me instead of just doing the normal backup, I wrote and uh, doing a clone. Uh, doing a clone. What I did was just went through and wrote a, a Python script that said, okay, so I have. Uh, Top hat, cufflinks, uh, bed tools, uh, basically all the tools. Go through, install those, and then get the most recent version. And so basically, so I did that. So basically, I kind of tested it out a couple times. And so basically, that's what. And when I when I decided, okay, I want to uh, kind of when I got to a point where I want to transfer everything over, because when we got some more bigger hard drives, that's what I did. I just ran the script and just hit go. And well, I didn't run the script, but basically, I hit go and basically just it installed everything onto the new computer. That that be that be one option because instead, of, like I said, being static, but basically just go through. Um, and it was actually interactive. Ask, okay, do you want to install this? And you say no. So you, you'd have to you'd have to have a little bit of interactive. You just it'd go through and just start. You can pick which tools you want to install. Other questions? Well, we're a little bit early, but um, we'll thank our speakers again for this session.